Uh, my name is Brian Klein. I work at SoftLayer in the product innovation team uh, where we primarily do um, research and development uh, and uh, mostly around new products, uh, but also around new technologies, uh, including OpenStack. Um, and uh, we're going to talk today about um, metrics and logging and a little bit of dashboard um, type stuff, but more so around how you can combine metrics and logging into one central store uh, to make it easier for you to um, uh, both correlate you know, actual log events with your metrics uh, and uh, be able to, to report more accurately on what's happening in your, in your infrastructure. Um, so in systems monitoring, uh, Traditionally, there's two domains. Um, they each have their own advantages, advantages and disadvantages. Um, and they're kind of mutually exclusive for the most part. Um, and logging, um, everything is pretty much unstructured. Um, your, your value, so to speak, um, for a single hit is a line of text, um, which could be, you know, it could be syslog text, it could be app log text, it could be anything else. Um, and so as a result, you never really know um, for sure how to parse it. Um, even there's, there's even some variation in syslog as well. Sometimes you may not get the service name um, and so on and so forth. Uh, and I kind of feel like this, is a, this, this approach is kind of overutilized. Um, you see a lot of people logging just basic metrics. Uh, especially as far as um, periodic jobs are concerned. Um, so they really should be using less of that, uh, especially considering that um, you know, humans spend too much of their time worrying about um, logging, how to parse it, how to archive it, how to search it. Um, and so it's just not productive. Um, on the other side, you've got metrics, um, which are much more well-structured. Um, you know, you usually have very strongly tied values with uh, each type of metric. Um, and inherently or otherwise, there's usually some kind of uh, unit associated with each metric, whether it's, um, you know, bits per second or uh, megabits um, consumed, um, so on and so forth. So it's much more easily parsable. Um, unfortunately, not enough. Uh, pieces of software use that kind of instrumentation on the level that they should. Um, and so as a result, uh, we're very limited in a lot of cases in how we can parse that and intelligently use it in an automated fashion. Um, the best example probably being that, uh, you know, if we had much more comprehensive information, we could conceivably write, you know, scripts and things that would act as frontline uh, reactors to um, either warning events or error events and so forth um, before a, a human actually has to get involved. Um, so one, one step to this, and uh, there are a whole slew of, of um, law consolidation frameworks out there. Um, for simplicity's sake and and just as a, an example, we're going to stick with our syslog today. Um, I'll mention a, a couple of the others later because uh, they're they're quite versatile. But um, in this in this case, uh, uh, we've got an example application in Python um, that uses OpenStack style logging. Uh, it's logging to the local Zebra facility in syslog. Um, and we're throwing just a simple warning message saying we can't do some operation, um, conceivably open a door. Um, and the next, I guess the next process in line that receives this message is the local syslog on that machine where the app server is running. Um, so what we want to do to centralize these logs is uh, at a very bare minimum um, is to choose either UDP or TCP based on what your requirements are. 
Um, if you want to make sure that every single log message absolutely gets to its destination, you go with TCP. If you can afford to lose a few in aggregate, you go for UDP. Um, it's, it's a lot less uh, overhead involved. And so you can, you can kind of see the configuration here that would be involved. This is literally all you would need in uh, the local syslog or our syslog file um, with the two uh, at signs denoting TCP and the single at sign denoting UDP. So we're forwarding those to log host on the standard port 415 or 514. And on the actual log host, um, we've got a slightly more uh, involved um, configuration file. So we were uh, explicitly loading, since they're not uh, by default loaded, the uh, UDP and TCP uh, input modules. And we're also telling it explicitly which ports to run on. Uh, we're passing um, just some basic local system all stuff to the actual syslog on the log host. And uh, everything else on local zero, which is where our app logger um, is logging to and forwarding from, um, we're actually forwarding straight into um, var log stack, all of that log. Uh, it really depends on the use case. You could you could really go either way. If if you want absolutely no disk I/O interference on your your uh, app servers, then that might be the way to go, uh, where you have everything forwarded no matter what and no no local copies. But uh, in the case of something like Scry, where you're uh, you're storing and then you're storing and then forwarding uh, essentially, and then deleting when you can. Um, you might uh, you might choose to do that if you absolutely need that durability. Um, so so that covers logging. Uh, um, just at a very basic perspective, anyway. Um, as far as metrics go, um, we have this wonderful project inside of OpenStack called Telometer um, that is essentially just metering. I know a lot of people use it for billing, but it's a lot more um, versatile than that. So um, there are three main pieces uh, to Celometer in terms of the way it gathers data or receives data, processes it, and then pushes it back out to any number of interested parties. Um, the first is agents and collectors. Um, agents obviously um, running you know, on your compute nodes, on your network node, wherever, um, and emitting in information in real time to the actual Celometer server. Um, collectors usually run from the Celometer server and they're going out uh, periodically and hitting other services asking for uh, usage information and um, anything else that might be relevant. The second part to this are transformers. Um, and uh, the transformers are usually involved in if you have to do any kind of, um, I guess, conversion of data or conversion of units or um, just any kind of uh, uh, adjustment to that data before you actually go and process it. And it's totally optional. You don't have to do anything with it at all. And that's actually the default behavior. Um, the next step, uh, final step, are publishers. Um, and they take, uh, you can have any number of these that you want. You can write your own publisher plugins, the same way you could agents and collectors and transformers. Um, they just take care of broadcasting all the process information to other systems. So you could have one that goes straight back into um, another AMQP cluster or um, down to the file system if you really wanted to shoot yourself in the foot. Uh, or you could have it go into something like Riemann, which we're going to talk about today, um, which is more of a time series database. 
So um, here's an example of a, well, an abbreviated, abbreviated example of a plugin that I wrote for Riemann, um, a publisher plugin, um, that uh, as soon as everything flows through the agents and collectors and transformers in Celometer, uh, it would flow into you know, all, the, all, the, all the publishers that we have in our timeline, our, our uh, pipeline. And uh, we receive a number of samples, and we're adhering to the published samples uh, standard interface here. Um, so we're just iterating through all the samples we received. Um, we've got some minor abbreviation here, just for space reasons to convert that sample into a payload that Riemann is going to understand. And uh, just as a preface, Re uh, Riemann works off of protocol buffers, so uh, we have a limited number of fields that we can send across. Um, some of them are completely free text, others are a little more stringent. Um, but this, this event uh, dictionary just kind of shows you all the different uh, fields that you could use uh, with Riemann. So after all that, we're going to send each of these messages as a, uh, as a payload through protocol buffers. And uh, for the plugin, um, I omitted this just for uh, brevity, but uh, you know, just similar to all the other publisher plugins in uh, Celometer, uh, there's some default uh, values here. Um, the Riemann default port is 5554 on UDP. And I went a little crazy with the default TTL, uh, making it uh, upwards of a day. Um, but that's pretty much all I would need in my, uh, my Salamnar configuration for this plugin. So uh, the actual pipeline in um, Salamnar is actually quite easy to, to uh, digest. Um, and you can have multiple instances of these within the same file, so you're not really limited to just one. Um, in this case, um, I've bumped the interval way down from 60 seconds to two seconds um, just for testing and, and just trying to uh, throw some serious amount of, uh, of data at, the, at Riemann. Um, you can selectively specify um, which meters you want to include in these payloads. Um, in this case, we just want everything, and we'll figure out later if we want to discard it or not. Uh, in this case, we have no transformers. There's no need to. And for publishers, you can see that uh, we've got a plugin-specific URI scheme um, just for Riemann. And there's a little bit of magic that I'm uh, not quite sure I understand yet under the hood of how this gets translated into a class name, but it works. Uh, so, um, and then aside from that, we've also got just some uh, plugin specific uh, transport options. In this case, I'm specifying explicitly that I want to use TCP since I can use either one with Riemann. So now that we have uh, a plugin, we have data flowing through. Um, now what? Um, and this this looks a lot more daunting than it is because we've already covered a third of it. Um, we've already got all of our accelerometer infrastructure in place, uh, receiving data, optionally receiving errors um, if services choose to publish those errors through MQP. Uh, we've got all of our syslog servers um, publishing into that one main uh, centralized host, which could be running our syslog, uh, could be running Logstash, Fluent, or Flume, and there's a whole variety of others that are out there. Um, it seems like uh, this week I've been hearing a lot about uh, Logstash. It seems to be the, the most recent favorite um, for good reason. Um, but they all kind of have the ability to plug into uh, multiple inputs and multiple outputs. So, I mean, they're all pretty versatile. So, um, uh, 
So in the ne next step here, I have them going just for uh, demonstration's sake into a queue in case we get backed up. We don't want um, you know, log stash uh, or our syslog or anything feeling the pain of that. Um, so once those get queued up, um, I've left a blank space here intentionally. We'll come back to that later. Um, that would conceivably go and straight into a Riemann server um, through protocol buffers. Um, and uh, right away, it can make a determination based on the filter and the configuration file, um, how much of that it needs to filter out, how much of that needs to, it needs to actually process and act upon, whether those actions are alerts or firing off outside processes to try and uh, preemptively fix, fix a problem before a human has to. Um, but one of the advantages is that you can actually uh, uh, create an entire topology of Riemann servers. So if you have an extremely busy frontline Riemann server or a, a whole array of them behind uh, a load balancer or a DNS round robin, you, um, you can still have each of those, as long as they have the same configuration, forward to um, other Riemann servers behind them based on uh, a service name or a host name that, that these log messages are coming from. Um, so for instance, let's follow the path from the master up to uh, Riemann A here. Uh, in this case, we might have received a, cri a pretty critical error um, in, um, let's say, Nova Compute. Um, we obviously want to uh, notify a human about this, so we send out an alert and, uh, and they, they kind of handle that from there. The other route we could take uh, is <clears throat> if it's a service that ends up being filtered down to Riemann B or C, let's just say for the sake of discussion that all of your sender log messages and stats are being filtered down to Riemann C. Um, you know, sender, if you have uh, a fairly uh, large sender infrastructure, one node is not going to matter that much if it if it falls over. So you might feel a little bit better about uh, about kind of automating either the restart of it or um, trying to pull information about what's happening to it or just take it out of some kind of load balancer until you can figure it out um, yourself. So in this case, we are firing off a script um, that may do any of these things. Um, could be Python, could be Bash, could be whatever you want. Um, and once it's done, hopefully it uh, finishes, finishes successfully. And uh, if not, uh, it's very important that the Riemann master knows about that because you don't want to get into a situation where you end up in an in a infinite loop of the same events triggering the same action over and over again and not being able to get anywhere. Um, and this is all, all data that you can filter on uh, uh, either by tag or description or host or service, um, just about anything you can imagine. And we'll have a list here in a second. Um, but in the, uh, the other case here, if it fails and there's uh, pretty much no way to recover, uh, we can also uh, shoot back up to where the megaphone is and actually alert a human. Uh, so Riemann, um, just as a little bit of history, was uh, named after a mathematician um, who, by all accounts, made some pretty significant uh, contributions to the field of mathematics. Um, one area in particular was um, in analytics and analysis and statistics to some degree. Um, and is some, uh, by some accounts is credited as, uh, as having contributed uh, enough to uh, 
to be able to mathematically describe the theory of relativity. Um, so obviously a pretty important name. Uh, now the project itself um, was written a couple years ago um, by a guy called uh, Kyle Kingsbury. Um, and you can find his, his contact information here. He's, he's usually happy to talk about anything related to this. Um, but uh, the project is it's only a couple years old, um, but they've got about 36 contributors now. And uh, this tends to scare a lot of people off right away, but it's, it's written in Clojure, which is basically Lisp on top of the JVM, or a Lisp variant. Um, but it's actually quite expressive. It's it's very concise language, and we'll run through a couple of configuration file examples, where you'll see um, uh, a how the configuration file is is actually a piece of code, but also um, how simple it is to do some of these these really advanced use cases of of alerting and um, and uh, uh, statistics. Um, and just as a, um, I guess a, a good overall statement of, of what Riemann is uh, as a product is uh, it's just a low latency transient shared state um, for systems with many moving parts. Um, I, usually just, I usually describe it as a, an in-memory time series database to some degree um, that's just kind of a moving window um, in time. So it's not meant to do any kind of backend storage. It has the ability to pass that off on other systems. For instance, you can have it uh, pass all of its data off into Graphite. Um, I believe there's one more backend driver, but I can't remember what it is at the moment. Uh, but uh, um, you know, Graphite's pretty popular. Everybody seems to like it, so you can still get that, that functionality out of it. And you can also use Riemann's API to pull data out of the Graphite uh, Whisper files as well. Um, so it works both ways. So what does it actually do when it receives a piece of data? Um, first step is, uh, based on the configuration file that you give it, um, any kind of event that comes in, and again, all these events are going to be uh, tracked individually in memory uh, in this moving window. Um, it's checked against all the filters that you've defined, any kind of thresholds that you define for alerts, um, any kind of uh, other calculations or whatever else you want to do. Um, the second thing it's going to do is actually, if any of those pass, it's going to perform actions um, that you've defined um, on, on each of those, uh, each of those cases. Uh, the third part is um, if you have configured it to, it'll send all of this uh, event data to a backend like Graphite. Um, I think they have plugins now for sending data straight into Librato. Um, possibly New Relic, I'm not quite sure on that one. Um, so there's, they're starting to add more and more support for not just uh, self-hosted backend services, but also uh, third-party hosted services that uh, do a lot additional um, analysis for you. And the final step is, uh, since it has a moving window in time, it's got to uh, eventually expire all, um, any events in the index that are no longer uh, within that time window. And you can force something to stay in the index by uh, explicitly specifying a TTL. So if it's something that you deem as a significant event, you can actually write it a small piece of code within the config file, um, or even bef before it gets to Riemann, um, that defines that TTL. So if you wanted, you know, a week or a month, um, you could still retain that regardless of expiration in the index. So, <coughs> excuse me. 
So these are all of the uh, different fields <coughs> that you can use uh, in your prot protocol buffers payload. Um, you've got just a simple integer-based uh, Unix epoch timestamp. You've got um, the maximum TTL in seconds. Um, and that's more of a countdown. It's not a uh, timestamp. Uh, you've got uh, the originating host name, an originating service, which really could be anything. Um, a state, which is just freeform text that you, that you can define. Um, so it's either warning, critical, okay, um, whatever you want to want to pick. Uh, then the metric itself is the value that's associated with the event. It's the actual metric of interest here. Um, so you would you would traditionally think of the service and the metric being the key value pair that you would use in something like uh, StatsD or um, a whole slew of other systems. Um, and tags are optional. You can attach actual tags to an event. So if you wanted to um, tag events with either dev or prod or um, QA, um, you could certainly do that. And uh, that way you don't have to send out, you know, alerts about, you know, your dev environment. Um, and then the description field is, is also free form. This is where log messages would come in um, to the same uh, central store as your, um, your metrics. Um, and that also includes stack traces. It, uh, it's not limited to one line. It's, it's just as much as you want to put in there. So here are some uh, example um, config use cases. Um, some of these are pulled and adopted from the uh, official Riemann docs at Riemann.io. Uh, there's a whole whole bunch of them in there. Um, you could spend a day going through all of them. Uh, the first one, if you want to have somebody be alerted, but you only want to have that person be alerted five times within an hour about the same problem, um, on the same host and the same service, um, you can use this uh, roll-up feature or this roll-up helper um, that defines how many times they should receive that alert in X number of seconds. Um, and then, of course, the action following it um, if that passes. Um, and then for, uh, let's see, any kind of error state whatsoever, um, you could have it send an email to uh, apparently your beeper. Uh, and uh, the last example here, you could actually calculate um, for each five second interval, similar to what StatsD does, except uh, a little bit quicker, is um, the 50th, 95th, and 99th percentile um, of. Uh, hits, in this case, to an API, um, which would give you, uh, you know, probably much better insight than just a uh, full-on aggregate. Uh, just a few more examples here. Um, you can also keep track of the uh, rate of total exceptions per second uh, across all of your apps um, by using this, this first example here. Um, for anything that comes in tagged as an exception um, and that actually has a metric, uh, uh, you can separate it out by service um, so that uh, on the fly, Riemann can actually generate its own additional statistic or its own additional event um, that's prefixed with the service name and then just has exception rate um, at the end of this. Uh, and then would actually be able to graph that metric if you if you desired. Um, and the last one uh, is is probably one of the more useful ones I found. Um, so you have a service that uh, just quietly goes offline in the middle of the night. Uh, there's not a whole lot of ways you would normally know about that. 
um, unless you had something that was constantly checking, um, whether it be a cron job or a long running job, um, whether that process was alive. So <clears throat> what Riemann can do is if you, if you have it set up to do periodic check-ins, um, in this case every 10 seconds, which uh, I think is about as ag aggressive as uh, Neutron gets, um, you can actually say, you know, if, if, uh, if I haven't heard from this, this uh, service in 10 seconds, then email somebody about this. Um, and you can group that by host and service so that um, whoever you're alerting won't get alerted by the, you know, won't get alerted about the same host and service, but if another host with the same service uh, fails, then they're gonna get an email as well. And so they can actually start getting a meaningful picture before they've even uh, gotten back into uh, the office or to a computer to actually investigate. Um, and the reason it says uh, where a state expired um, here is because anytime um, you expire, anytime an event expires from the index, it's going to a regenerate an identical event for the same host and service uh, with, a, with a new timestamp, except the state's going to be expired. Um, so it's a really um, kind of a clever way of checking whether or not uh, a service is actually alive. Um, so what's next? Uh, I think, uh, you know, the, the research that I've put in, into this so far, um, I really think uh, uh, would benefit uh, a lot of people if, if, if there were a standard set of, of rules that they could plug into a Riemann configuration file. Um, it is a bit daunting when you first jump into uh, to Riemann because it's all closure, even the, the config. So uh, I think having that would help but uh, uh, you would have to include things like um, which services you want to monitor, what log file patterns you want to look for, um, what kind of metrics you want to absolutely critically uh, keep track of. Um, and this way you can actually uh, spend way less time digging around in log files um, and, and more time optimizing and finding uh, some of the more subtle issues that happen um, much closer to the time that they actually uh, start happening. Um, and then also a standard way of executing preemptive actions before involving a human. Um, I'm, not <clears throat> I'm not terribly versed, uh, well versed in Clojure. There's another guy on our team who is. Uh, but you know, if it was in Python, it'd be easy. It'd just be a, a P open call to, uh, to run a process. Um, but, uh, you know, in this case, I'm sure there's, there's a standard library um, uh, extension with Clojure that could do this. Um, and uh, I guess the other half of this as well, um, and I researched this quite a bit. Uh, I almost put the cart before the horse uh, before I had the rest of the presentation done, was on the uh, machine learning side of uh, this is, Ideally, uh, especially as um, you, know, you get thousands and tens of thousands and hundreds of thousands of compute nodes or um, any kind of nodes, um, they're all gonna be generating log data, they're all gonna be generating metrics. Uh, you're going to eventually reach some critical mass where there's no way you can cost effectively hire humans to manage this anymore. Um, you're going to have to eventually start training a system to look for these uh, in a proactive fashion. And there's already, you know, there's uh, 10, 20 year old technology out there that already does this. Uh, it's just not widely used yet, except in things like spam filtering. Um, and so in the course of the research um, that I found, um, there was one uh, that stuck out quite a bit um, called, uh, I believe it was the SCM 114 discriminator. Uh, 
it's a reference to uh, to Doctor Strangelove. Um, it uh, it's hasn't been very well maintained, but it actually does a very good job. It supports a number of different uh, algorithms. One of them is uh, just a simple Bayesian. There's another one that uh, does a uh, hidden Markov model. There's another one that does OSP. Um, and what you uh, what you should be doing is is capturing as much uh, meaningful error information as you can, bundling it together, and uh, telling you know a system like that, hey, this is this is all you know bad or significant data. So learn this as as being you know something that should should flag a human for. Um, and that way, over time, you can get better and better confidence in its answers about you know, classifying log messages as they come through in real time. Um, so you're essentially training the computer to watch, watch all of your systems for you, which it's going to be much better at, at doing. It may take a while to get there, but uh, the payoff in the end, I think, is, is, is more than worth it. Um, and. Uh, I guess also combined with um, the actual, actual metrics themselves, um, since you would have uh, data about the, the log patterns themselves and the stats in the same uh, time series store, and again, your choice in back end is really up to you um, and based on your needs, but it becomes um, just a lot easier to identify patterns over time, um, whether you do that in real time or if you do that after the fact. Uh, so that, you know, if you have a whole group of machines that you bought around the same time or a whole group of hard drives that you bought around the same time and, and they all came in on the same pallet uh, and you start to see degradation of the machines um, that are actually running those, uh, you know, it's it's obvious from hindsight what the problem was. It was probably a shipping issue um, uh, or a factory issue, but uh, until you have that kind of visibility, it's not always going to be that obvious. And seeing the patterns are really going to be key to uh, uh, proactively managing these ever-growing clusters, um, whether they be compute, whether it be com uh, network, storage, anything. Um, and uh, one other thing I wanted to show you as well, there was a video a while back that the author of Riemann posted showing the actual throughput. Um, Riemann supports WebSockets as well as a native protocol. It can do TCP, UDP, um, and WebSockets um, because it's got uh, support for a web interface. Um, his next generation dashboard, which I don't think has been released yet, uh, supports um, something like up to a couple of thousand, well, he says a thousand events per second. Um, and this was over a year ago. Um, I'm sure it's progressed since then. But he's basically sitting here watching, uh, looks like about 10 or 11 systems and the load average on them. And the just the amount of speed that you get, not just on the Riemann side, but also on the WebSocket side. Um, is actually quite amazing. It's not something you would typically see in a, a normal dashboard. Um, and the the console that comes with Riemann itself is actually uh, quite extensible. Uh, it's a little difficult to use at first because it's only driven by keystroke, but uh, I believe that's on the top of the list um, for them to improve. Um, but I would, I would definitely encourage you to check out, uh, um, to, to check out the project and, uh, uh, and see how it might uh, 
help out you know, your, your own monitoring solutions. Um, I also plan, um, and I'll enlarge this as well, um, I, I worked with an, another member in the community to open or to uh, more liberally license a, an existing Python wrapper around the CRM14 um, learner and classifier. And so I published that, um, and I've also published uh, kind of a basic uh, syslog listener that forwards events into Riemann um, that, uh, that I've got on my, on my GitHub right away. Um, but, uh, but yeah, um, you know, certainly, continue, uh, certainly plan to continue looking into this a bit further. So if there's enough interest and there's, uh, interest in participating, um, I, would, I would love to hear from you. So, uh, and with that, are there any questions? Yes. Um, I would probably say, I'd probably say load balancing would be best. Um, they can't handle up to allegedly 14,000 uh, events per second per core on a machine. Um, Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, you could probably use um, HAProxy. Um, if you did that, I'd probably use it in TCP mode uh, just so that you would uh, ensure. It sounds like if you wanted to load balance it, you would want to ensure that all your, your messages get there no matter what. So I'd recommend something like HA proxy, just very lightweight, very fast. Yep. Yes. That was um, just more of a kind of an afterthought. Um, if you, depending on which of those solutions you use, um, you could end up with a fairly taxed centralized R syslog server um, that just would allow you to just offload as much as possible um, to something like Rabbit, uh, where it can just store and just move on. Right. Oh, cool. Um, there is an API on the Riemann side that will let you get historical data. Um, as far as streaming it, you probably have to just play it back. Um,
Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, there's there's a lot of different ways you could go. Um, I at one of our uh, our company hack nights a while back. I uh, just to see if I could do it. I I wrote a stats D to Riemann bridge. Um, of course, it was in Python, so it's never going to end up taxing Riemann by any stretch of the imagination, um, being on the JVM. But uh, um, it actually worked. I mean, uh, it was fairly limited just because you don't have the luxury in StatsD of all those extra fields. Um, but it's something that you could easily customize and, and say, OK, well, here's a, a host name. Um, or here's the system host name. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to package this in from or alongside this stat over to Riemann. Um, stuff like that. But at the base of it, you would still have just the, uh, the name of the metric and the, the actual metric itself. Yep. All right, thank you very much.